All right, so we are continuing our series called The Worship Centered Life. Um, and uh, with a big family day like today, we're going to focus on worship centered marriage. And so uh, the main thing today is that we're supposed to love our spouse to the glory of God. Now, um, the pro- there's a problem here. This young generation here is growing up in a world where marriage is not honored. Um, people my children's age and younger are not getting married. Marriage rates are the lowest they've ever been. And I think people my age and older, we need to take a little bit of responsibility for that because a lot of us have not done marriage the way God wants us to. Um, we've cheapened it. We walked away from it. Uh, and and we, have, we own some responsibility for that. So we need to present a vision for, for, for how, how do we glorify God in our marriage. Um, and so here are four things that all spouses need to communicate every single day in order to glorify God. The first one is this. The first one is this, is that I love you. You know your spouse needs to hear that every day? I love you. Um, uh, 1 Corinthians 13, four through eight says this. Love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy. Does not boast. It is not proud. It is not, it is, it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And it sounds like I'm preaching to the choir, like of course everybody needs to say, I love you. But listen to this, listen to this. Our society has no idea what love really is. Um, The Apostle Paul writes about what biblical love really is in this passage. Yes, it actually is more than just a wedding thing. Yes, it actually is scripture, okay? Uh, It does not say that love is an emotion. It does not say that love is a gushy feeling. It's not, it, it has nothing to do with that. Every single thing that Paul describes here is a choice. Hear this. Everything that Paul says in this passage of what love is, is a choice, all right? Love is patient. Patience is a choice. Love is kind. Kindness is a choice. It's not boastful, not proud, not dishonoring to others. Those are choices, not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. That is a choice. Love keeps no record of wrongs. That is a choice. It rejoices with the truth. It protects, it trusts, it hopes, it perseveres, it never fails. Every one of those things has nothing to do with how you feel. It has everything to do with the choice that we make to love. All right, so when a Christian couple says, I love you, they're not just saying, I feel nicely towards you. When a Christian couple says, I love you, said, I am choosing to do these things. I'm choosing to love you. It's a decision. It's not an emotion. Christian couples take the kind of love that God has given to us and they give it to each other. Right? How does God love you? Well, he chooses you. God's love for you isn't an emotion. Believe me. God's love for you is not based on an emotion of how he feels that day. If it was, we'd all be sunk. Okay? I, I know that there's enough sin in my life and enough yours to make us unlovable. And God does not choose us because of how lovable we are. He chooses us because that's who he is. He actually chooses to love. So people here today and online, when you say, I love you, you are not expressing an emotion. You are, that emotion may be present to be sure. Emotions are great. Some of my best friends have emotions. It's great, but it is there. And it's there from time to time. But when you say, I love you, you are saying, I'm pledging to be patient. I'm pledging to be kind. I'm pledging to not be envious. I'm pledging to not be proud, to honor you, to put you first, to be slow to anger, to never keeping a record of wrongs. I'm choosing to rejoice with the truth. I'm choosing to protect you, to trust you, to hold you, to hope in you, to persevere. And this won't fail. And people say, well, Dave, you make it sound so academic. No, not academic. I just choose to build my marriage on a foundation that lasts, not on one that changes with my mood or how I feel on a particular day. See, the choice of love is the foundation of the house. The feelings and the emotion of love are the walls. Okay, you know what happens when you try to build a a house without a foundation? 
It falls. See, that is what our culture's gotten so wrong about marriage that we try to build the walls. We think the emotion, the feeling, the tangle down your spine is the thing. No, the choice to love is the foundation. Without that, you have nothing. And once you have the foundation of love, then the emotions and the feelings happen, okay? I think simply looking at the world we live in, failure rate of marriage just speaks to the fact that we've gotten love completely wrong, okay? People have been sold a false bill of goods by Hollywood and mass media and social media. Remember, the people selling you this are the worst at love and marriage that are on the face of the planet, okay? Build your marriage on biblical love, the choice of biblical love, and that's going to refine to God. So the first thing that Christian couples need to, need to express every day, I love you, and the, the power behind that statement is not I'm feeling nicely, I choose to love you. And all those things that Paul wrote, I'm choosing to give you today. The second thing that, that couples need to communicate every day is I trust you. I trust you. Now I'm gonna go to a really famous story in the Bible and the kid's gonna like this, okay? Because this is the story of David and Goliath. And you're like, Dave, why are you talking about David and Goliath in marriage? Is your spouse a giant you have to slay? No, no, okay. That's not, that's not where we're going right now, okay? But I'm gonna take you to, the, to one of the, my favorite stories. You know, the guy that's named after me in the Bible, David. Uh, he's, he, he goes out and, and the, the, the Philistine army's over here and the Israelite army's over here. And every day, this giant named Goliath, he's like eight feet tall, nine feet tall, walks out and he, and he taunts and he says, hey, send your, send your best guy to fight me. Why should all our armies kill each other? Uh, you know, send your best guy to fight me and whoever wins will be the servant. If, if, if I win, you'll be our slaves. If, if, if you win, we'll be your slaves. For 40 days he did that. No one would go out and fight him. And so David's little shepherd boy runs up to see the battle and he sees Goliath come out and he, and he hears him taunt and he goes up to King Saul and says, hey, I'll go. And King Saul basically laughed and he said, this, this guy is a, is a champion, you're just a kid. And look what David says in 1 Samuel 17, 33 through 37. Saul replied, you're not able to go out against the Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man. He's been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant's been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant's killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he's defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear, will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine right? There's nothing scarier than trusting somebody because you've put yourself vulnerable up to risk. I get that. And all of us, if you lived in this world more than 10 seconds, have had your trust betrayed. I've had people betray me. I've, I've trusted people that have let me down. I get it. I understand. Believe me, I get it. How hard it is to trust someone. And people, people say, uh, well, I just don't trust anyone. Of course you do. The fact that you're sitting in here means you trust the builders of this, this place. You trust the guy who put up the ceiling. The, you, you trust the guy that built that chair you're sitting in because you didn't trust anybody, you wouldn't be sitting there. You wouldn't be in this building. You, we, we cannot live without trust. We cannot live with it. So how do we decide to trust? Well, it's easy. Consistency. We trust consistency. Consistency is the key to building trust. Inconsistency destroys it, All right? And this famous story, like I said, one of the most famous in the Bible, David walks out to face this champion. He's so overmatched, it's unbelievable. And not only his life, but the life of his entire nation is in his hand. Now, how in the world would David have enough trust in God to walk out there and do that? Well, easy. Because God, has came, through, God came through for him in the past. He fought a lion and a bear. Now, last year... Newsweek did a study of Americans, of course it's always Americans, who think they could take on wild animals with their bare hands. This is actually really funny, okay? Uh, they started with, with little and, and all the way up and they said, could you take on and beat a, this wild animal with your bare hands? Now, 72% of Americans said they could beat a rat in a fight. Three out of four, that, that's probably pretty accurate, about three out of four of us could take on a rat, okay? And 69 think, 69% think they could beat a house cat in a fight, okay? Yeah, I know, well, well they're, they're plotting our untimely demise. They are, all right? So, that, okay, so about seven out of 10 
People think they could take on a house cat, okay? Well, the numbers start going way down. 9%, seriously, 9% think they could take on a crocodile and win. 8% think they could beat a gorilla. <laughs> now, this is the best one. 8% think they could beat an elephant. An elephant? All right, but it gets better. 8% think they could beat a lion, and 6% think they could beat a grizzly bear. Now, a grizzly bear are about eight feet in height and weigh up to 1,700 pounds. And there are 8% of us, 6% of us out here, six out of 100, think that you could beat a grizzly bear with your bare hands, okay? Um, those are the people that ride motorcycles without helmets, okay? Uh, yeah, those are the guys that do that, okay? So... What, so what King David, what David is saying here is I have, I, I know I was outmatched, but I was defending my father's sheep. The Lord called me to go after him and the hand of God gave me victory over the lion and the bear. He doesn't say I did it. He said the Lord did this. Now the Lord put him in that situation for that very reason was to show that he could trust God. And so this, this Goliath guy was nothing compared to what God had, had, had sent him to before. And see, God had built up trust. He'd been consistent. He'd come through for David every single time he'd been in, in, in trouble. So David had no problem whatsoever trusting God. Now, if God had let him down one time, had been there, then not, David would not have walked out to face Goliath. See, we see the battle. We didn't see the trust that God was building his whole life. Okay? God had come through for David in the past. And therefore, David had no, not one inkling of doubt when he faced Goliath. In a marriage, we must have that same trust. We must have that same trust. God gave us an amazing example of how to build that trust with consistency. Remember, that trust is very slowly earned and very quickly lost. You can destroy in one instant everything you spent your entire life building trust-wise. So be wise when it comes to trust that people place in you, especially your spouse, Guard the trust that people place in you like you're guarding Fort Knox, okay? I want you to think about trust and Fort Knox being, being the exact same thing. If your spouse has trust in you, do nothing, nothing to violate, to violate that trust. It's not worth it. Whatever would call you to violate that trust is not worth it. It is not worth it. If you see a line that you never intend to cross, Stay away from it. Don't go anywhere near it. Let's say that this line right here is this line I, I don't want to cross, and you know what those lines are. I'm not going to get up here and dance next to it and poke my toe over it. No, I'm staying 10 feet away because I have no desire because I know it's on the other side of this is not only sin, but damage to my spouse. And destroying that trust is not a price that I or you should be willing to pay. I love you, I trust you. See, David looked at God and said, I believe you. You call me out here, you say you're gonna be there for me, I'm, I, I believe you. And I believe you, says one spouse to another, because you've built up such a record of trust and consistency with me, I believe you. Marriage won't work without it. The third thing that we say to each other every day, after we say I love you, after we say I trust you, is I forgive you, I forgive you. Every day, Colossians 3.13 3, says this, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now, I wanna tell you all something, right? And y'all better listen. Many spouses see it as their job to obtain justice from their, from their other when wronged. Instead of being quick to forgive, the, the spouse punishes the other one to get even. I've seen spouses punish the other one by withholding affection, giving silent treatment, or, or, or even worse, going on the attack. So the other will learn their lesson. Marriage becomes a courtroom instead of a bedroom. Each spouse presenting their cases against the other in competition and a quest for justice. Spouses become plaintiff and defendant against each other instead of look, working together to build a home. This isn't God's plan for marriage, you all. If you're a revenge spouse, hear me. If you're a revenge spouse, you're gonna be, be single very soon. Right? 
Your time together is limited. We need to stop seeing our spouses as our enemy. Stop seeing uh, our spouses against us. So many of us treat us, treat our spouses like they are. And the problem with unforgiveness is unforgiveness is a living being. It's that rat that 72% of people think they can beat. That's what unforgiveness is, and it grows. It grows into the crocodile of resentment, which grows into the grizzly bear of belittling. Unforgiveness leads to resentment. If you have unforgiveness in your home, it will lead to resentment. And resentment left untouched is gonna turn into belittling. Christian counselors tell us that the number one sign your marriage is in trouble is when the spouses belittle each other. They communicate contempt for each other. And you know what it is. We say, well, that's ridiculous when your spouse brings something to you. Or, or that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard when your wife says something. Or that you have no right to feel that way. Communications of contempt, belittling. That's when your marriage is in real trouble and it's unforgiveness that, that has resented, grown into resentment and grown into belittling. Resentment and belittling can also be communicated non-verbally. A condescending chuckle. Or an eye roll. You know what they are. You do them and they've done, been done to you. Communications of contempt, belittling. Those are signs that forgiveness is not present in your home. So Catholic Christian Church and those online, I wanna ask you, are you a good forgiver? Are you someone that is good at forgiving? Just like love, forgiveness is a choice. It's not something that, we, that, that, we hap that happens naturally. We are by nature fallen creatures that do not forgive, that hold grudges, that try to get even. That's our natural state. We are not good forgivers by, by nature. It's a choice we must make. Are you a good forgiver? And, the, and you say, well, of course I'm a good forgiver. Well, here's how you know. Do the people in your life, your children, your spouse, girlfriend, boyfriend, people at work, all the people in your life, do they routinely confess their mistakes to you freely? Because if they don't, what that means is that you are not a safe person to ask forgiveness from. You're not, a, you're not a safe person to be to make mistakes around. You're not a safe person to be weak. Or you're not allowed to be human. You don't allow people to be human because when somebody makes a mistake or they mess up, you blast them and you bring it up the next month and you bring it up the next year and you, over and over and over again. So don't be surprised if that is your reaction when somebody messes up or makes a mistake or, or outright sins against you, that they will try to withdraw and hide from you because you're not safe to, to confess to. If that is you, I wanna ask you in the name of Jesus to change that into and become a good forgiver. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you, Scripture tells us. Is that what God does to us? We, when, we, when, we blow it, when, we, when we're devastated and sin has overtaken us, we go to God to confess, does he smite us with lightning bolts? No. He says, he, he's the prodigal son's father. He embraces us. He throws us a party. He says, my son, my daughter's back. That's what he does. That's how God forgives us. That is how we forgive our spouses. That's how we forgive the people around us. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. So Catalyst Christian Church, are you a good forgiver? The people, that if you, here's, here's how you know. Do you see a lot of fake people around? Fake people? Oh, everybody's just so fake. I can't stand all these fake people. Have those, those words from your mouth? Yeah? Well, the reason people are fake the reason people hide, the reason people put up walls may be that you are not a good forgiver. They don't feel safe to be human around you. It's people like that are gonna be very lonely. Spouses, people, people who have sinned, people that have made mistakes. Here's something else. Forgiveness is not a right that you demand from your spouse. Forgiveness is not a right that you demand from people. You can't say, you can't point to scripture and say, see, see, God says you have to forgive me. God says that, so you have to do it, or you're not a good Christian, or you're not a follower of Jesus. No, you don't have the right to do that. Forgiveness is not a right to be demanded. Forgiveness is a gift your spouse gives you because they love you. 
It's a gift. It's given freely. It says, I love you. Therefore, I forgive you. I can't demand this of you. This, it, it, it cannot be demanded. It is given freely because they love you. So if you've ever been forgiven by someone, if you've been forgiven by your spouse, if you've ever forgiven someone, it's done in love. Okay? We, can't, we have no right to demand forgiveness. So we say, I love you every day. We say, I trust you every day. We say, I forgive you every day. And the fourth is this. I choose you. I choose you. Hebrews 13, 5 tells us, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. God says, listen, I'm enough. I'm enough. My ways are enough. My sp the spouse that I've gifted you, yes, yes, your, God has gifted you a spouse or children. I, the, the, these are gifts and I will never leave you and they're enough, so be content. Don't go looking over here. Don't go looking over here. Don't go looking over here. Be content with what you have and choose your own home. Every day, husbands and wives must choose each other. Every day, my wife has to choose me. She's free to go anytime she wants. I, I, we don't run a prison. If she wants to leave, she can. Me, I can too. We, we're, we're, that, that's, we stay together by choice. Every day we choose each other. And here's the thing, you all. I don't just choose to stay in my house. I don't just choose the life we have. If, if we have nothing, if the house burned down, if the cars quit working, cars got stolen, we lost, if the stock market crashes and our 401k is gone and we're destitute, I still choose you because my marriage is not based on those things. My marriage is based on you because I choose you, not the life we have. I choose you. Come hell or high water, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, I choose you you. That's why the marriage vows say those things. Our circumstances don't dictate our marriage. Our choices do. We could win the lottery, lose it all. I choose you. We could be madly in love one day and angry at each other the next. I choose you. We could have 20 kids and not be able to have kids at all. I choose you. We could be healthy for the next 50 years or be in and out of the hospital for the rest of our lives. I choose you. See how this works? The best marriages are the ones where both spouses believe they got better than they deserved, y'all. When you look, say, my wife could have chosen anybody she wanted. She chose me. I got better than I deserved. And the same way. Others feel the exact same way. Those are the best marriages. I say, I choose you. I'm committing for life. And that choice isn't changing. I'm choosing you every day for the rest of our lives. And that's because, guys, that's the kind of love and devotion God has for us. Listen, that's the kind of devotion God has for us. God looked at us before any of us knew him or even had a concept of him, and he said, I choose you. God has chosen us to be the objects of his affection, to, be, to, to forgive, to give us eternal life. He has chosen us, right? God has modeled uh, this from, since time began. He has never thrown us away. He has never based his love or commitment on how he feels on that particular day. He has definitely not based his choice for us on our behavior. He's committed himself to us for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, in sickness and in health. Those wedding vows a couple say to each other, you understand that God said those to you first, right? That he said those to you first. That's what the Bible literally says. That, that God has chosen us in good times and bad times, God says, and, and you, in, in, in times of obedience and times of rebellion, I choose you. I, and and um, I'm not changing, God says. I'm not going anywhere. You can run as far away as you want from me, and I'm still here because I'm not changing. I choose you. That's what God has said to everybody. And we're called to do the same. People, first of all, God looks at us and says, I choose you. Out of all the things I could do, I choose you. And so we look at everything this world has to offer and we look back up at God and we say, God, I choose you. I choose you. And, and, I, and God, and I'm not going anywhere. You say you're not going away, I'm not going anywhere either. I am finishing this race. God, I, I, I am, I'm, till death do we uh, join together. I'm not going anywhere. I choose you, God, because you chose me. And then we take that and, we, and after, after we say that to God, we say that to our spouse. I'm not going anywhere. I choose you. Because love is a choice. 
He's looked at us and thrown away all our options and decided to love us, to trust us, to forgive us, and to choose us. We do the same thing for him, and we do that in our homes. See, we, look at, we have to look at our spouses every day. Every day, not just once in a while, every day. And say, you know what? I choose you. You're my friend. You're my wife. You're my husband. You're my love. You're my friend. You're my favorite person. And I choose you. Forsaking all others. You're my love. You have my heart. And I choose you. That's what needs to be communicated every day. And when you take those four things, I love you, I trust you, I forgive you, and I choose you, and you make those live and breathe in your homes, do you know what that is? Your home is a worship service to God. It is shouting to this terrible, awful, broken world what God does when he blesses someone. This is what it looks like. Your whole, your whole home shouts the glory of God to this world when you make those things live and breathe in your home. So how about it, people? Can we do this? Can we do this? Can we look at our spouse and say, I love you? Not, like, not the gushy emotion, the choice of love. Can we, I look at, look at each other and say, I forgive you, I trust you, and I choose you. Can we make that live and breathe in our homes this, this week and from now on? Can we do that? No, we can't without the grace of God. You can try to do that in your own power. It's been tried. You know how long it lasts? About as, good as, about as long as you feel good. Without the supernatural power of God in your home and in your marriage, you don't have a chance. It's been tried, failed every time. So what I'm gonna ask you spouses to do today, you people today, is not just say, I'm gonna do these four things. No, I'm gonna ask you to get down on your knees and pray, God, flood our home with your presence, with your joy, with your power. And Lord, make these things live in me because I don't have enough strength to make it happen on my own. I've tried it, God, and it ain't working. So Lord, change my heart today. Turn my heart towards my spouse. Turn my heart towards my, my children. Turn my, my, my heart towards my home. And let these things, these statements, these scriptures, your word, live in me because God, I choose you. And I choose my family. That's what we need to do today. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I pray that what we talked about today, Lord, that, that, that would just happen in every home, the people here in person and online. Father, I pray that, that spouses would look at each other and just say, I love you, I trust you, I forgive you, and I choose you. Not by our own power, by the power of you living in us. Lord, bless and, and sustain each home. Fill each home represented here with joy. Fill every home in here with the kind of love that your Bible describes, not this, this nonsensical, gushy thing that's sung about by the worst people at it. Lord, bring biblical love into our homes, into our marriages. Lord, we need them. And I pray, Father, that you would give everyone the strength to see it through to the end. Lord, you chose us, so we choose you. And we take that relationship and we extend it to our homes. Love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.